Hi, this is Alex from Groovy Entertainment. Today we got another record to play for you. Today record is the Ivory City in the Fairy Princess from 1977. So let's get started. Ivory City and its fairy princess. One day, a young prince was out practicing archery with the son of his father's chief advisor, when one of his arrows accidentally struck the wife of a merchant while she was walking about in an upper room of her house close by. The prince had aimed at a bird that was perched on the windowsill of that room and hadn't the slightest idea that anyone was nearby, or he never would have shot in that direction. Consequently, not knowing what had happened, he and the advisor's son walked away, the advisor's son teasing him because he had missed the bird. A few hours after, the merchant went to ask his wife about something and found her lying in the middle of her room, her eyes closed, and an arrow fixed in the ground within a foot of her head. Supposing she was dead, the merchant ran to the window and shrieked, killed my wife! Oh, she was a good wife, too! The neighbors quickly gathered, and the servants came running upstairs to see what was the matter. They examined the woman and discovered that she had only fainted, and that there was only a slight wound on her shoulder where the arrow had grazed. As soon as the woman opened her eyes, she told them that two young men had passed by the house with bows and arrows, and that one of them had aimed at her on purpose as she stood near the window. Well, when he heard this, the merchant went to the king and complained about what had taken place. His majesty was enraged at such obvious wickedness and swore that the most terrible punishment should be given on the offender if he could be discovered. He ordered the merchant to go back and find out whether his wife could recognize the young men if she saw them again. So the merchant asked her if she remembered what they looked like. Oh, yes, dear husband. I should recognize them again among all the people in the city. Well, when the king heard of this, he had an idea. Good. Then tomorrow I will cause all the male inhabitants of this city to pass before your house, and your wife will stand at the window and watch for the man who did this yes. wanton deed. Yes. A royal proclamation was issued. And the next day, all the men and boys in the city, from the age of ten upwards, assembled and marched past the house of the merchant. The king's son and the advisor's son had been excused from obeying this order, but they were curious and wandered by with the crowd just for fun. As soon as these two appeared in front of the merchant's window, they were recognized by the merchant's wife. Look there! That's the one! And this was immediately reported to the king. What? My own son and the son of my chief advisor? What examples for the people? Let them both be executed. Chief advisor, you arrange it. Please, your majesty, I beg you. Let us first investigate the facts in the case. Things are not always what they appear. Let me ask your son what happened. Young prince, tell me. Why have you done this cruel thing? I shot an arrow at a bird that was sitting on the sill of an open window in yonder house and missed. I guess the arrow struck the merchant's wife, for which I am truly sorry. Had I known that she or anybody had been near, I should not have shot in that direction. When the king heard this, he calmed down slightly, but was still considerably upset. We will discuss this later. Right now, I order that the people be dismissed. Their presence is no longer needed. That evening, the king and his chief advisor had a long and earnest talk about their two sons. Although the king hardly wished this on them, he said that for the benefit of the nation, they should both be executed. But the chief advisor suggested that the prince should be banished from the country instead. This alone would be enough of an example to the people about what happens to wrongdoers. The king agreed. So, on the following morning, a small company of soldiers escorted the prince out of the city. When they reached the last city building, the chief advisor's son overtook them. 
he had come as quickly as he could, bringing four bags of coins on four horses. Throwing his arms around the prince's neck, he hugged him and explained why he had come. Oh, my friend, I cannot let you go on alone. We have lived together, played together since we were children. And so we will be exiled together and we will die together. If you care for me, I'm grateful for your presence. But consider, think what you are doing. All kinds of trouble may come to me in my exile. Why should you leave your home and country to be with me? Because you are my best friend, my very, very best friend. And I love you like a brother. I should never be happy knowing that I abandoned you in your hour of need. Oh, I want to go with you. I want to. So, the two friends walked along as fast as they could, and behind them marched soldiers and the horses with their valuable burdens. On reaching the place of the borders of the king's lands, the prince gave the soldiers some gold and ordered them to return. The soldiers took the money and left. They did not, however, go very far, but hid themselves in ditches and behind rocks and stones and waited till they were quite sure that the prince did not intend to sneak back. On and on the exiles walked, till they arrived at a small village where they decided to spend the night under one of the big trees of the place. The prince built a fire and arranged the few articles of bedding that they had with them, while the advisor's son went to the butcher and the baker and the fruit merchant to get some food for their dinner. For some reason, he was late in returning. Perhaps the bread was not quite ready or the butcher was closed and he had to find another. After waiting an hour for his friend, the prince became impatient and got up and walked around. He saw a pretty, clear little brook running along not far from where they had camped. And hearing that its source was not far away, he started off to find it. The source was a beautiful lake, which at that time was covered with the magnificent lotus flowers and other water plants. The prince sat down on the bank and, being thirsty, scooped up some of the water in his hand. Fortunately, he looked into his hand before drinking, and there, to his great surprise, he saw reflected, whole and clear, the image of a beautiful fairy. He looked around, hoping to see the reality, but seeing no person, he drank the water and put in his hand to scoop some more. Again, he saw the reflection in the water that sat in his palm. He looked around again and this time discovered a fairy sitting by the bank on the opposite side of the lake. When he saw her, he fell so madly in love with her that he dropped down in a faint. When the chief advisor's son returned and found the fire lighted, the horses securely tied and the bags of coins lying all together in a heap, but no prince, he became worried. He waited a little while and then shouted, Prince, Prince, oh, where are you, Prince? Come on, I know you're all there, Prince. But there was no reply, so he got up and went to the brook. There he came across the footprints of his friend. Seeing these, he went back at once for the money and horses, and bringing them with him, he tracked the prince to the lake, where he found him lying on his back as though he were dead. The prince's friend became very upset. Alas, alas, my brother, are you alive? Oh, do not die and leave me here. Speak, speak, I can't stand it. And he poured a little water on the prince's hands and face and gently shook him. In a few minutes, the prince, revived by the water, opened his eyes and looked about wildly, as though he could not quite believe where he was. Oh, thank God you're awake. I thought you'd never open your eyes again. But what happened, my brother? My friend, what happened? Go away. I don't want to say a word to you or to see or anything. Go away. Oh, be serious. Come on. Let's leave this place. I, I don't like it. Oh, see, I, I brought some food for you and horses and everything. I brought everything. But let's eat something and get out of here. Come on. Let me help you up. Go alone. Goodbye. What? What, what, what has happened to you? That you suddenly don't care about me? A little while ago we were close friends and, and now you, you hate the sight of me. I have looked upon a fairy. Only a moment ago I saw her face. 
When she noticed I was looking, she covered her face with lotus petals. Oh, how beautiful she was. While I gazed at her, she took from her bosom an ivory box and held it up to me. Then I fainted. And now I care for nothing except her. Oh, if you can get me that fairy for my wife, I will go anywhere with you. Oh, brother, you have indeed seen a fairy, for I know her. She is a fairy of the fairies, a most exquisite creature. She is none other than Gulizar of the Ivory City. This I know from the signs she gave you. From her covering her face with lotus petals, I learned her name. And from her showing you the ivory box, I know where she lives. So be patient. Don't worry. I will somehow arrange your marriage with her. When the prince heard his friend's encouraging words, he felt much comforted, got up and ate, and then went away cheerfully with his friend. On the way, they met two men who belonged to a family of robbers. In this family, there were 11 people. One, an elder sister, stayed at home and cooked the food, and the other 10, all brothers, went out, two and two, and walked about the four different roads that ran through that part of the country, robbing those travelers who did not fight them, and inviting others, who were too powerful for two of them to manage, to come and rest at their house, where the whole family attacked them and stole their belongings. These thieves lived in a kind of tower, which had several stone rooms in it, and under it was a huge pit, where they threw the corpses of those they had killed. Two robbers came forward and politely spoke with them, and begged them to come and stay at their house for the night. Oh, travelers, it is late and the night is dark and cold. There is not another village within several miles. Come, stay with us and enjoy our hospitality. Should we accept this good man's invitation, brother? The advisor's son frowned slightly to show his disapproval. He did not trust these men. But the prince was tired and thinking it was only a whim of his friends. He said to the man, very well. It is most kind of you to ask us. So all four of them went to the robber's house. Soon, the prince and his friend found themselves imprisoned in a room, and they were very unhappy. No use groaning. It doesn't help. Give me a boost up to this window, and I'll see if there's any way we can get out of here. No. 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 Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, for me. I can see below. There's a ditch surrounded by a, a high wall. Yes. Here. Oh, oh I'm, I'm going to squeeze through this window. No. Oh. my head. Oh, I'll jump down now. I'll jump down and go and look around. You wait here, wait here. I'll remain quiet until I return. After a while, he came back and told the prince that he had seen the most amazingly ugly woman, whom he supposed was the robber's housekeeper. She had agreed to release them on promise of her marriage with the prince. So the woman led the way out of the enclosed yard by a secret door. Soon, they were outside. Oh, we're here now, we're here, but, but, but where are the horses and the bags? You cannot bring them. And to leave by any other way would be asking for mortal trouble. You would both be killed in an instant, said the ugly sister. Oh, I walk by this door as we do. See, I, I have a charm. And with it, I can make them thin or fat. So the advisor's son got the horses without any person knowing it and repeated the charm. Making the horses pass through the narrow doorway like pieces of cloth. So thin they were now. When they were all outside, he restored them to their former size. He at once mounted his horse and took hold of the halter of one of the other horses, and then called to the prince to do likewise. Then they both took off at a gallop with the woman behind them. Now the robbers heard the galloping of the horses and the and ran out and shot their arrows at the prince and his companions. And one of the arrows killed the woman, and so she was left behind. 
on and on they rode until they reached a village where they stayed the night. The following morning, they were riding again, and on the road they asked for the location of Ivory City whenever they met a passerby who looked like he knew the area. After some hours, they came to this famous city and stayed in a little hut that belonged to an old woman from whom they feared no harm. At first, the old woman did not like the idea of these dusty travelers staying in her house, but the sight of a gold coin, which she prince dropped into the bottom of a cup, in which she had given him water, and a present of another gold coin from the vizier's son, quickly made her change her mind. Oh, yes, yes. Do stay. Uh, a few days, at least. Love, company, I do. Yes. As soon as her housework was finished, the old woman came and sat down with her lodgers. The advisor's son pretended to be completely ignorant of the place and the people and asked many questions. Um, uh, tell me, uh, what is the name of this city? Ivory City. I don't, don't you know that? thought the name was known all over the world and then some. On the mention of the name Ivory City, the prince gave a small moan and then a deep sigh. And the advisor's son looked at him hard as if to say, keep quiet or he'll realize we're up or something. Uh, good lady, is there a king in this country? Oh, of course there is, and a queen and a princess. The name of the princess is Hulizar, and the name of the queen... Uh, but here the advisor's son interrupted the old woman by turning to shake the prince who was staring about like a true madman. Oh. He pushed the prince uh, off to their room, telling the old woman they were tired from their journey. Once they were in their room, he told the prince that they were indeed in the right country, and it was only a matter of time before they would be able to see the beautiful princess. Oh, my goodness gracious. The next morning, they noticed the old woman was really fixing herself up. She had arranged her hair quite carefully and was wearing a new robe and shoes. Are you expecting company? No, no, I'm going to see my daughter who is a servant of the Princess Gulizar. I see her and the Princess every day. I should have gone yesterday if you had not been here and taken up so much of my time. No, I'm sorry, sorry. But uh, please, please, uh, do me a favor. Uh, be careful not to say anything about us at the palace. <laughs> you, you understand it. Oh. Uh, don't describe us or yes. anything like that, you know? As you say, not a word about the both of you. The advisor's son had asked not to talk about them at the palace, hoping that because she had been told not to do so, she would certainly mention their arrival, and so the princess would be informed of their coming. When the old woman arrived at the palace, her daughter was quite cross with her and asked why she had not come to visit when she said she was coming. Because, my dearest, two young travelers, a prince and the son of some great advisor, have decided to stay in my hut. And they demand a lot of my time. I, it's nothing but cooking and cleaning, cleaning and cooking the whole day through. I don't understand men, never will. One of them appears to be especially stupid. He asked the name of this country and the name of the king. Now, where on earth are these two from that they do not know these things? But never mind, They're, they are very great and very rich. They give me a gold coin each day and each night. After this, the old woman went and repeated almost the same words to the princess, who listened carefully. When the princess heard all she had to say, she hit the old woman several times and promised her worse if she ever again spoke of the strangers in front of her. That night, when the old woman had returned to her home, she told the advisor's son how sorry she was that she could not help breaking her promise and how the princess had hit her because she spoke of their arrival and all about them. The prince became full of despair. Oh, what a, what a, what a, oh, no. If she thinks this way concerning words about me, what then will be her anger and loathing when she sees me? Anger and loathing? No, no, no. She would be very glad to see you. I know this, I do, I do, I know this. In, in this treatment of the old woman, I understand her request that you will go and see her during next week when the moon is slight in the sky. Oh, thank heaven.
So that was part one of the Ivory City in the Fairy Princess. So if you like, subscribe, share, and comment, and have a groovy day. And we'll have part two coming out tomorrow.